Good morning, everybody. It's seven o'clock, and thank you once again for joining um, the series on ECMO. Can everybody hear me? Dave, can you hear me? Morning, Dave. Yes. All right. I'd like to introduce you this morning to David Stanton, who is a uh, paramedic with NEC 911 and the head of clinical and education, and probably the most clinically educated person I've come across in a long time and a very special friend of mine. Uh, David and I started with Antoinette and Lizelle, the ECMO trans uh, transport program about, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago with the, the first, very first series of lectures. And we devised without any, um, any knowledge whatsoever of ECMO transfer, a, a safe and, um, and ergonomic uh, transport method of the ECMO patient and did many ECMO transports uh, together. And uh, David then went on to teach many of his paramedics um, how to do ECMO transfers. And um, I can only say that if you do do an ECMO transfer with David, you feel very safe because everything is under control and you're able to work as a team. So um, with a lot of experience and many ECMO transfers, um, to his name, I'd like to introduce uh, David Stanton, who's going to talk about patient referral and retrieval. Um, and uh, then after this, I'd like to just talk about the practical sessions, because in lock four, a level four lockdown, I think we should uh, wait a while with the uh, practical exercises so we don't bring people together and break the rules. But David, please go ahead. And thank you for doing this lecture. I really ap appreciate it. Thanks, Mandy. Morning, everybody. Um, that's quite the introduction. I almost expect trumpets and stuff. Um, so yes, we're going to talk about the, the movement of patients um, on ECMO, uh, which is something that has happened or is increasing in, in how much it has happened in the last few years. Um, I think when ECMO first came out, it, it was almost inconceivable that you would move these patients. Um, but with the development of, of good systems, it becomes quite possible to move them. Um, and across the globe, there are uh, a growing number of services that are engaging in the movement of, of ECMO patients, um, although it is seen as quite a specialized um, environment. Um, so it's not every system that has the capability to be able to do it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why as we go along. The first thing I'm going to talk about, though, is the definition of critical care retrieval. Because just because you have an ambulance and a ventilator doesn't mean you're doing critical care. So uh, there's actually a definition published in South Africa around uh, what critical care retrieval is. Um, and there's, a, there's actually an article in press at the moment, or about to be in press, um, which talks to the details of what is required for a critical care retrieval team. Um, and those are the key elements there uh, on, on those sort of small pictures. Um, and that is critical care retrieval has got to do with a specific patient population. So it's the patient population that is kind of receiving ICU level of care or should be receiving ICU level of care. Um, the cases are specifically selected. So it's not, you know, just because the patient's connected to a ventilator, they actually may not be, be a patient for critical care retrieval. That just may be an ALS transfer if they're just on, on kind of standard ventilation. One of the key components to critical care retrieval is that it's done by a dedicated crew. So you can't take a part-time um, paramedic and just say, well, now you're going to go and do critical care today. Critical care retrieval needs to be done by full-time critical care teams. So uh, no matter which, which platform you're using, um, and when I say platform, if you're using ambulances or jets or, or helicopters, um, the crew working on them doing critical care trans transfers should be full-time critical care staff. That should be what they do all day, every day is critical care. Um, it, it can't be done by a part-timer. Obviously, it requires specific equipment. So it requires um, proper ICU ventilating capabilities. 
It requires the ability to do uh, controlled infusions. It requires the ability to carry ECMO devices or balloon pumps or whatever additional devices the patient's on. And there needs to be quite a, a strong quality uh, management system in the background. So there needs to be the ability to, in real time, consult with specialists um, in the field of the patient that's being transferred. The cases need to be reviewed and there needs to be opportunity for discussion around the cases so that there's learning opportunities coming out of that. So to put together a critical care retrieval system is not a, a, a simple thing. Um, one of the other concepts around critical care retrieval is that you should be taking the level of expertise that the receiving facility is going to be able to provide to the patient. So the idea is that you're not just moving a patient from one facility to the other, you're improving the level of care when the critical care team arrives. So very often the team will go to very rural, basic um, uh, medical centers where they don't have the equipment, they don't have the experience or the expertise. And as soon as the team arrives, the idea is that the, the level of care improves. It's not just a case of you know, copy paste the ventilator settings and move the patient. That's not critical care retrieval. That's just an ALS transfer. Um, the team needs to be arriving and improving things from when they arrive. Just as a matter of interest, the two badges on the right-hand side are an example of some of the kind of the recognition um, or the qualifications that are available to paramedics in the, in the world of, of critical care retrieval. Um, there's international board exams that you can write in terms of being either a flight paramedic or a critical care retrieval paramedic. Um, and they all moves afoot in South Africa to create a similar kind of space where there'll be a, a speciality um, in critical care retrieval. And that's often what critical care retrieval or ECMO retrieval will look like. Um, good luck even trying to find the patient in all of that. But the idea is that whatever needs to be done for the patient continues to be done or is started on the patient. So um, like I said earlier, this is not just a copy paste of, of kind of what you find at the referring facility. This is where everything that needs to be started for the patient is started, is done, and is maintained correctly. Um, and it's in any size of patient. So um, you need to have the equipment and the resources and the experts that can move any size of patient on ECMO. And I think our system, the, the smallest patient that we've moved uh, on ECMO was a I think it was eight or 10 month old um, that we took uh, an ECMO team out to place the patient on ECMO and then retrieve the patient. Just some comments really, and you've probably heard this in some of the, the talks before, is that ECMO is best done in specialized centers. Um, ECMO within the hospital space is done by a specialist team, and they will obviously be quite selective in terms of the patients that they do it on. Um, so one of the things just in terms of the logistics from a referral perspective is that that selection needs to have already occurred. So the, the referral and the, and the receiving hospitals need to have had long discussions around, is this a patient that is actually for ECMO? Is it the right patient that's been selected? Um, before we even start kind of considering a, a move. Um, and there's a couple of reasons to move the patient. The one of the reasons is to get them to an ECMO center. So these patients, you know, ECMO isn't just a simple procedure that you do the procedure and okay, now it's done, now we, now we can forget about it. Looking after a patient on ECMO, nursing a patient on ECMO is a very, very specialized, um, it's a very specialized procedure. Sorry, I'm trying to find out who that is so I can meet them. Feels like I'm walking in somebody's pocket. Okay. Um, and these patients are best nursed in ECMO centers. So we've had the experience a few times where 
in a peripheral center with very little experience, somebody's decided to place ECMO. And then they've suddenly realized that they don't have the ability to do the long-term care, long-term long -term nursing um, of the patient now on ECMO. And then the patient has to get moved to an ECMO center for a better outcome. Um, and then we talk about two different moves for, for ECMO. And the one is being moved for ECMO and the other one's being moved on ECMO. And the difference there is that um, if you want to take a patient and put them on ECMO in a peripheral space, you've got to move an entire ECMO team to the patient with all the equipment. They then need to have the correct space and um, equipment within the referring hospital to be able to place it. Uh, and then you've got to bring the patient plus the team back. Um, or you're going to make the decision that the patient is stable enough to be moved without ECMO, but moved to an ECMO center. Uh, and those moves are then done as rapidly as possible because those patients, if the patient's requiring ECMO, they're usually approaching the very unstable kind of phase of their pathway. Um, and a lot of those times with the patients that will fly purely because we want to get them to the ECMO center quicker for the ECMO team to do the insertion. Just the other thing in terms of, of ECMO movements is that um, ECMO retrieval also includes movements of patients on ECMO within a hospital. So when we talk about some of the principles now, we're, we're not just talking about moving them between hospitals, but these principles are also important when we consider moving the patient um, inside of a hospital. So to theater, to radiology, to wherever the patient needs to be moved once they've been attached to their ECMO device. So there's a couple of questions you need to ask when you're kind of getting ready for it. And uh, some of them are obvious. So for example, what's the, well, how far are we moving the patient? You know, if we're moving at five kilometers or 10 kilometers down the road, um, then a road transfer is completely appropriate. Um, and then you've got to make sure that you have the appropriate vehicle. So you've got to have an ambulance that will fit an ECMO machine in, and it'll depend on which, which ECMO machine they're attached to, how much space you need. Um, often when you're moving ECMO teams plus patients, you're going to need more than one ambulance um, to move the amount of equipment uh, and, and people that you need to move um, to do ECMO. Certain demographics, you know, age and gender are quite important, but what's really important is the patient's weight. Um, and if it's a very long distance transfers, we're looking at fixed wing transfers, then we need to know the patient's width um, because on certain of the fixed wing aircraft, there's a certain width to the door. And if the patient's wider than that, they're just not going to get into the aircraft. Um, and we learned in the, in the early transfers that that's one of the most important questions to ask is how big is the patient? Weight and girth sometimes um, to see if they'll fit. And unfortunately, the majority of patients that we move um, on ECMO tend to be the larger patients. Um, those, I think, clinically select themselves as the ones that do worse with their lung disease. So those are the ones that are more likely to need it. Obviously, a good description of the clinical condition and the, um, the attachments are quite an important uh, piece of information to know beforehand. And um, this picture is one of the early ECMO retrievals that we did. Um, and when we arrived to the patient, we arrived to 15 different infusions or infusion lines that were running on this patient. Um, and moving 15 infusions is fairly um, complicated and uh, just limited by equipment very often in terms of how many infusion pumps and things you carry. Um, so we spent a bit of time on this particular patient actually working out what infusions were required. Um, and in fact, found that there were quite a few conflicting infusions, quite a few kind of duplications and unnecessary infusions. So we were able to, to, to cut down the number of infusions on this particular patient, um, because 15 was certainly a little bit um, crazy. Um, and then some basic questions around the ECMO, you know, is it a VA or VV ECMO that we're doing? Um, because the approach to patient support is going to be slightly different. Um, and potentially the team that's going to be going with is going to be slightly different um, in terms of who you need to arrange to come with. Um, and then 
unfortunately, we operate in a world where somebody has to pay for the transfer. Um, and this is often the biggest delay that's built into an ECMO um, retrieval is getting authorization from whichever insurance the patient's on um, to go and do the retrieval. I think it's still being a relatively new um, treatment modality for most of the medical schemes. Uh, they're often very unsure. So we, we do have um, often fairly long delays in just getting the, the, those authorizations through. So it's one of the first things we start working on um, is getting permission to move the patient. Then you need a team to do the move. Um, and we've kind of learned that, that uh, the team can be fairly large. Uh, and depending on how we're transporting them, the, there can be limitations in the team. So if we're going in a fixed wing jet to a helicopter, um, it limits the number of people that you're able to take with you. Or if you're going by road, you can take um, quite a few more people. But a couple of things that kind of have to have, you need a, a dedicated person who just does coordination. Um, they don't get involved in clinical care. They don't um, uh, make any clinical decisions, but they're just there to coordinate the logistics, to coordinate the referring, the receiving, uh, coordinate theater. Um, just be the kind of stand in the background person who manages the whole process. And is very, also, very often also the person who just takes notes. There needs to be a coordination center. Um, so like a, a control room, which is able to make all the phone calls and do all the communication that's required, um, do all the following that is required to make sure that the move goes off without a hitch. And then in terms of the actual team, um, ideally there needs to be a person who's able to place the cannula. This is if we're gonna go and do ECMO in a, in a facility. So you need somebody who's able to place it um, and they will very often need uh, some sort of surgical assistant. There needs to be a physician, which is often an, an anesthetist, um, who's able to care for the patient during the insertion and then look after the kind of the critical care elements during the move. Um, in terms of setting up the ECMO device, you probably need a perfusionist who's able to set up the, the ECMO circuits and then to manage um, all of the elements of ECMO uh, care during the transfer. And then you need somebody who's actually able to manage transport um, in terms of transport logistics, packaging patients for transport, um, managing transport ventilators and transport monitoring. Um, this is that same patient who was one of the early cases we did. And as you can see, uh, there's an uh, uh, ECMO pump in the bottom left of the picture. There's also a balloon pump in the bottom right of the picture. So this was a patient that was on ECMO and a balloon pump. Um, what you don't see is that lying somewhere uh, around the patient's knees, there's also a pacemaker um, on this particular patient. So that was fairly complex uh, in terms of attachments. And then you need to decide what your platform is gonna be. How are we gonna move the patient? Um, is it gonna be an ambulance, helicopter or jet? Um, and that obviously, has influence in terms of how many people you're gonna take, um, how long it's gonna take. Um, and the selection obviously is down to, mainly down to distance in terms of how far we're going to fetch the patient. Um, probably we're going to use five or 600 kilometers as the cutoff um, for a jet. So if it's more than five or 600 kilometers, we'll, we'll use um, a jet to retrieve the patient. Um, we, we will go up to about 100 kilometers if we're going to do it by road, but if it's going to be more than 100 kilometers, we'll try and do it by helicopter. Uh, and that's just to try and reduce the out-of-hospital time because these patients, while they're being transferred, um, just transport alone uh, creates instability in these patients. Um, and one of the other things to consider is that, and we'll talk about lots of, of kind of the adverse things that can happen, but transport... Uh, if you look at the literature, for every one case that you transfer on patients on ECMO, you should expect one adverse event. So you expect on average one adverse event per transfer. So the less time that you're out of hospital, the better with these patients. Um, and some of the patients are going to be really little. So this was the smallest one that we've done. Um, so you then have to take 
a person who's able to insert ECMO cannula into the tiniest of the smallest patients. Um, and you have to take a team with that's able to manage uh, a really small patient in terms of their, their ventilation and their packaging and their movement. Um, sometimes the teams that you're going to use, so, so this uh, picture on the left is in the ICU, the referring facility where they put in the ECMO cannulas. Um, and because of the transport modality we used for this patient, which was a helicopter, we weren't able to take an anesthetist with, but the referring facility quite happily then supplied an anesthetist to assist um, in terms of care during the, the insertion procedure. So it, it really is very varied when we start moving patients around. Going for really long movements, you're going to use a, a jet air ambulance. Um, and you can just see they're laid out on the ground, the, the amount of equipment that goes with um, when you do uh, an ECMO transfer. Um, there's massive amounts of equipment uh, that need to accompany the patient. And then you've got to obviously have a, a jet air ambulance that's big enough to accommodate the entire team plus the patient who's going to be on ECMO. So you, certainly you're going to have your hands full. Would you, you need to have all of the logistics um, coordinated. Then just some of the things to think about in terms of equipment. Um, you need to have monitoring equipment and obviously defibrillation uh, equipment, and it must be proper multi-parameter monitoring equipment. So it needs to be a monitor that can monitor A-line uh, and CVPs uh, where it's placed. So you can have real-time monitoring of all the pressures. Um, it needs to be able to do proper internal CO2 monitoring, uh, saturation monitoring. Um, you obviously need a ventilator. Uh, and by preference for critical care retrieval, you should be using piston-driven ventilators, not oxygen-driven ventilators. Uh, for two reasons. One, if your oxygen supply has, a, has an interruption, it continues to ventilate. And you're able to do low-flow oxygen ventilation. Uh, what low flow means is that you can connect um, just by a normal kind of oxygen tubing to your ventilator. Um, and while you may not be able to, it depends on the oxygen, uh, on the patient demand, you may not be able to ventilate at sort of 100% um, FiO2s, but on low flow, you're able to use a lot less oxygen um, over time. Uh, and when you're moving patients long distances, this is preferable because the oxygen kind of consumption is just massive um, with an ECMO patient because not only are you supplying oxygen to the ventilator, but you're also having to supply oxygen via uh, the ECMO pump. Um, so you, you almost have to double up on, on whatever oxygen supply you're taking with. Um, my other comment on oxygen is you need to be able to do oxygen calculations. So you need to be able to know based on consumption, how many cylinders you need for the move. So you need to be able to do simple calculations like how much oxygen is in my oxygen cylinder. So you know, if I've, if I've got 300 liters in a small cylinder and I'm running it at 10 liters a minute, it's gonna give me at most 30 minutes, uh, likely only 20. So you need to be able to do all of those, those oxygen calculations. Obviously, you need your ECMO equipment. Um, so you need the ECMO pump and you need all of the, the cannulas and the, the circuits. Um, and ideally with somebody that knows how to prime them and, and set them up. Um, and then for transport, you certainly need some sort of backup pump ability. Because if there's a failure on the pump, um, it's not like if you're in a hospital and you can just go and grab a spare pump, um, you need to have some way of, of continuing um, the pump activity. Uh, some of the devices were a manual or a hand crank type of, of setup, and that needs to be available and needs to be checked that it's working. Um, infusion devices, you need to have enough for the number of, of infusions that the patient's on, um, and they need to be charged, something that often gets uh, overlooked. And then power and oxygen adapters. Now, this depends on where you're going to, um, but we've learned that if we go into certain parts of Africa to go and do ECMO insertion, the oxygen ports are different uh, 
to what our equipment uh, attachments are. So you need to have the adapters for that if you want to use the hospital's oxygen. And depending on what country you want to, also if you want to use the electricity, you need to have the ability to plug into whatever they have. Just in terms of all of the equipment, obviously it needs to have some form of battery life. While you're in the, the ambulance or in the aircraft, you can often plug in um, the devices, but the move between the hospital bed and the, the ambulance or the aircraft um, is done on battery power. So you need to make sure that all of the devices that are above um, have, are, are able to work on battery and the batteries are in good condition. And then if they're going to be flown, they need to be aviation rated. And aviation rated is just about um, the assessment of will the device work in a, a changing pressure environment? And will the device work in an environment where there's a lot of vibration? So they would have, the devices would have been tested to check that they actually function in those, in those environments. Um, I would suggest that for road transfer, there's a big benefit to using only aviation rated equipment. Um, and that's also just down to how well the equipment copes with vibrations. Um, it's quite important that you've got a, a good team dynamic. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that come into play with team dynamic. One of the important ones is role allocation. So before you even start um, with moving a patient, everybody will need to know what their, what their role is going to be um, during the particular patient transfer. Um, because it, it needs to be prepared and kind of planned and the team needs to be able to communicate really well. Um, almost based on, on the aviation kind of crew resource management principles, which is um, kind of over communicating where every single step is discussed. As soon as there's potentially a problem on the horizon, it's brought to everybody's attention so that everybody is aware of whatever problem is coming up and that it can be dealt with. Um, training and practice is also really important. So the photo here is one of the training courses we had a couple of years ago where we had teams just practicing moving patients um, on ECMO and balloon pumps and things, just to, to practice it, to go through it, troubleshoot, um, and be prepared because the worst will happen. Um, as I've said, the ECMO transfers have a adverse event rate of one per transfer. So expect that at some point you're going to have to deal with at least one adverse event. Um, and the team needs to be able to work together as quickly as possible whenever something happens. Uh, and the team needs to be able to communicate really quickly and effectively um, during these. Um, documentation uh, obviously is really important. Um, uh, the international uh, also uh, ECMO people have got some suggested documentation in terms of what needs to be recorded um, for ECMO transfers. Um, we also came up with uh, our own transport documentation kind of based on that and our experience. And it's, it's because a normal you know, ambulance period just doesn't capture everything that happens on an ECMO transfer. Um, and it can be simple things like you know, the, the different ECMO pressures that, that the machine is telling you, uh, the settings that you're putting into it, um, but also the peripheral things in terms of you know, what decisions are made, why the decisions are made. Because these moves are kind of such high risk, um, they carry quite a high medical legal risk as well. So the, the level of detail in terms of documentation um, is a lot more than in a normal critical care retrieval. Um, and there's a bunch of risks um, that come along uh, with these movements. And one of the interesting ones was that high acuity ventions become secondary. So normally if we were to send a, a team to move a patient that was on a pacer and ventilated, um, they would spend a lot of their time focusing on is the pacemaker uh, doing what it's supposed to effectively? And they would be checking it regularly. They'd be looking at the ventilator regularly and, uh, and monitoring um, all of the, the output uh, kind of figures. But as soon as you add ECMO to the patient, suddenly that becomes the focus 
and things like ventilation and making sure the airway is secured and checking on the pacemaker become secondary to the ECMO. And these are things that we would usually be putting massive amounts of attention onto. Um, so that is, that is a very high risk in that the, 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 patient, the fact that the patient's on ECMO can be a massive distractor to other really high acuity interventions. Um, and the way to get around that is to make sure that in the team, you've got dedicated tasks and dedicated people responsible for each different component. So somebody who's going to be what, looking after the, the kind of airway breathing thing, you know, they're the ones that are going to be watching the ventilator, make, uh, managing the airway the whole time. And they're not going to even worry about the ECMO kind of intervention for the duration of the transfer. Um, because if you have somebody that's trying to do the ventilation plus the ECMO plus the pacing, um, that person's going to prioritize what they think they need to be managing uh, and something is going to be overlooked. We've already spoken about the battery and oxygen supply, so that's a big risk in terms of movement. Um, you'd never want to run out of any of those during, a, during an ECMO transfer. Um, vibrations during transfer can cause all sorts of problems. Um, it causes clotting, it can cause um, things to become dislodged. Um, it causes practitioner discomfort. So especially if you're doing um, aircraft transfers, the, when you're sitting in an aircraft and you're being continuously vibrated by the aircraft, you actually hold your body tense against the vibration. And that on itself just causes fatigue in, in the treating person. And especially if the team is not maybe used to flying as much, um, just the flying will cause them severe fatigue uh, from the vibration. Obviously, there's a big risk of disconnection. Um, you're moving things around. The, these ECMO patients, especially all the tubing, is best left just kind of still and not played with. But as soon as you start moving people around, there, there's a real risk that a tube gets hooked on something um, and disconnections can be disastrous. Space is obviously a problem. So um, whether you're in an ambulance or an aircraft, the space is very much limited compared to, to an ICU um, environment. So it's awkward and uncomfortable to do whatever you need to do in these spaces. And that's one of the big reasons why you need to use a team that is well experienced in doing uh, critical care and in doing ECMO because they have to be experts at what they do. Um, because they're suddenly having to do it in a smaller space, in a, in a noisier space, in an in unfamiliar space. So they've got to be pretty jacked up in terms of their normal clinical care. Often there's international issues. So if, we, if we're doing international transfers, things like passport control, um, uh, customs, all of those things add logistical challenges to, to the transfer. Um, border kind of regulatory authorities are not interested in the fact that it's a life-saving mission. Um, they still want to do all of their normal regulatory processes. You know, they want to see everybody's passport, including the patient. They want to, certainly in the custom space, you know, look at the equipment, know what's going on. Um, very often the devices have got to go through x-rays and that, you know, they want to be doing their normal checks. Um, so whatever service is doing, it needs to have a very good working knowledge of international logistics. And one of the big challenges is the referring facilities are almost never familiar with what ECMO is about. So when you go into their facility and you start setting up um, and performing the ECMO intervention, um, the team will often not get a lot of support from the, the referring team, purely because the referring team just doesn't know what's going on uh, and what they can do to assist. And I mentioned disconnections. So sometimes disconnections happen. Um, this particular disconnection happened transferring a patient out of a lift and the stretcher got hooked uh, kind of in the lift step and the ECMO machine didn't. And so the tube got pulled on. And one of the things that we had practiced um, when we were preparing for ECMO transfers was the concept of having clamps um, close to hand or clipped onto your uniform so that if there was ever a problem, you knew exactly where the clamps were and you could get to them quickly. 
So when this particular disconnect happened, um, the clamps went onto the ECMO tubing really quickly uh, and kind of tried to reduce it. That was the guilty kind of attachment that came apart. Um, and you can see it's supposed to be cable tied, but if it wasn't cable tied quite tight enough. Uh, it can just pop out as soon as there's uh, any pull on those on those cords. Um, the the other end of things is whenever you're doing ECMO retrievals, the team needs to have the opportunity afterwards to kind of debrief um, what happened because it's going to be a similar team that does the next move in the future. So you want to be making sure that you have the, the time to just kind of talk about how did it go, what went well, what could we do better next time, so that the future ECMO transfers go better and better each time. Um, I think it is something that's going to become kind of more and more common um, as, as people get to know about it. We know that in the current COVID um, climate, ECMO is one of the treatment modalities for the, the patients kind of with no other option. Um, although in, in the COVID environment, by preference, we're moving the patients to the ECMO centers and then putting them on ECMO in the ECMO centers, um, rather than moving treatment teams around. Um, and that's got various factors, infection control, um, availability of ECMO teams, um, as well as just the general kind of chaos that's going on, it's easier to move patients back to the ECMO centers first. Um, and then the other thing to maybe kind of remind everybody is that, you know, mo moving patients is never without risk. Um, obviously, the highest risk is borne by the patient um, because just being on ECMO means that they're in dire straits, but moving them around, uh, and we see it with, with just about every ECMO we've, we've done, ECMO movement we've done, there is a dip in kind of the, the vital signs environment, whether it's blood pressure or oxygenation, just the physical movement of the patient does, I don't know if it's a word is annoy them, interfere with them, um, and there always is going to be some kind of detrimental effect. So, so movement is not innocuous. Um, it does carry risk. And unfortunately, we know from, from January this year that movement also carries risk to the treating crews. Um, whether you're in an ambulance or an aircraft, being in this, the outdoor space, there's, there's added risk of, of incidents happening to the transfer team as well. Um, my last slide, for those of you that want it, is there is a, a really good also um, guideline in terms of ECMO transport um, that they put out a couple of years ago. So if you either go to that link or take a photo of that um, barcode, it will take you to some, some really nice or nicely written guidelines in terms of ECMO transport. Uh, and they discuss uh, pretty much what I've spoken about this morning, which is you know, what teams are required um, what are the considerations to, to think about? Um, and they, they even speak to, you know, if you want to set up an ECMO retrieval system, what are the elements that you need to consider um, in terms of structuring a team and training and getting people together? Uh, ECMO retrieval is not simply taking a perfusionist or a cardiothoracic surgeon, throwing them on an ambulance and saying, cool, let's go and do ECMO. Um, it's, a, it's very much a system-driven uh, event, which requires the, the entire system to function. From the, the referring hospital identifying the right patient, the receiving hospital um, selecting the right patients, and then putting together experienced and trained teams that are coordinated and kind of um, quality controlled with the ability to speak to and upgrade to whatever relevant specialists are required. Um, and then obviously the event needs to be recorded, documented uh, and quality assured to make sure that the system gets better. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I guess I can open for questions.
um, and you can by selection either type in your question or unmute yourself and ask your question. Are you done? Yeah. Well done. I was listening. I saw the picture of and I ran away in the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions for David um, in the chat? Just want to say thank you for a wonderful presentation, says Antoinette Rue, David. Cool. And the rest of the 50 participants, no questions to be asked. Well, thank you very much, um, David. There seems you, you know, when you don't get asked questions, it's either that you've done such a fantastic lecture that it's very clear to everyone. Or you or put them on sleep. Or at seven o'clock in the morning, everyone's asleep. So um, I thank you very much. Once again, it was an absolutely outstanding lecture. Um, it will be available on, uh, on our YouTube uh, platform. Uh, for anyone to uh, go and have a look at. And uh, I'm going to talk to you and Antoinette and Lizelle about the possibility of cancelling the practical sessions until level four has been settled or COVID is settled. But thank you very much, everyone. I think this may be the last lecture in the series. Am I right, Antoinette? Um, next week, we still have the um, balloon pump. Is that going oh, forward? That's right. We're doing balloon pump next week, eh? So going forward. Okay. Yeah. Guys, don't forget to join us next week. We'll send you an invite again on uh, Balloon Pump. Charlene Swanepoel, thank you, Mr. Stanton. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. You can go back to bed now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.